Hi there and welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics. This time, Sir Jim Ratcliffe's red revolution at Manchester United. Since taking a 27.7% stake at Old Trafford in February, the petrochemicals billionaire has wasted no time in leaving his mark on the club. His representatives are in charge of the football operations at United and were responsible for replacing Eric Ten Hag with Ruben Amorim as head coach of the men's team. Plans are also afoot for a new 100,000 capacity stadium, a Wembley of the North, no less. But all of this comes at a cost, and Sir Jim has angered supporters by whacking up prices for kids and pensioners to £66 per game. My name is Adrian Goldberg. I'm an investigative journalist and West Bromwich Albion season ticket holder, joined as usual by Charlie Methven. Charlton Athletics Chief Executive, one-time Sunderland Director. He was also given professional advice to both Arsenal and Spurs. He was a boyhood Oxford United fan. And a good win for Charlton Athletic in the FA Cup. Charlie, you're in the hat for the third round, 4-0 away at Warsaw. Not a bad result there, quite good in League Two this season. Yeah, no, it was an absolutely cracking result, Adrian. It caps off a really good week. Um, we, We won away at burst in the league on Tuesday. Um, and then, as you say, it's, it's one of those classic banana skins, isn't it? You play against a club in the division below you, but who are, who are, you know, who are right at the top of the division below you and who are full of confidence and the crowd's expecting an upset and all this type of stuff. So to go there and turn them over 4-0 um, was, I think, you know, a, a really decent, you know, really decent effort. Um, and we're in the, in the hat for the third round where who knows, perhaps we could have a where's the money gone derby <laughs> um, visit to the Hawthorns for me and I can come and sample some Belty with you along the way. Fantastic stuff. And we're also joined by Chris Blackhurst. Chris is the author of The World's Biggest Cash Machine, Manchester United, The Glazers and The Struggle for Football's Soul, a book, if you're looking for one for Christmas, that I can 100% recommend. But Chris, you're not a United fan. You're a Fulham fan. As we speak, you haven't played yet. And uh, how's the season gone for you? Um, you crashed by <laughs> Wolves last week, I noticed. Uh, my Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, we, beforehand, I kid you not, we were sitting in a sitting in the bar beforehand, planning that, thinking that Fulham were going to win seven on the trot, and we were we were all planning our European tour, and um, we then go and lose four one to Wolves at home. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. That's the nature of football. And now we're playing Spurs away. And then uh, we've got Brighton on Thursday at home. And that's going to be very hard. And then even harder is Arsenal at home a week today. So, um, yeah, but saying all that, we're having a good season. I mean, we still miss, uh, it's weird, we still miss Mitrovic. Um, You know, he's our best scorer, top scorer. Uh, The Wolves game was made for him. we were making all these crosses, but there was no one on the end of them. Um, and it just fell away and they scored. Um, anyway, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> still, a, still a painful memory. Well, look, yeah, yeah. I want to talk about Sir Jim Ratcliffe in the round. And yeah. you both got insight onto this. But I want to talk first about what I see as a fan as the war being waged by big clubs on intergenerational support at yeah. Liverpool. And this was raised by Joe Block from Spirit of Shankly, the Liverpool Supporters Trust with me on this podcast recently. And you'll remember this, Charlie. And Joe was pointing out that although Anfield's capacity has grown since the new Anfield Road End was built, the number of season tickets has not grown correspondingly. It is very difficult for Joe as a grandfather to attend a match with his son and with his grandson. And it seems to me that United in charging £66, both for over 65s and for children, are involved in a similar activity that people who assume that they will be able to pass on their love of their football club to their children and to their grandchildren, legacy fans like me, may be very sadly disappointed because clubs would sooner have day trippers who will spend much more in the club shop, spend much more on refreshments and who will pay much more for a ticket. Am I onto something here, Chris? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, in, in my book, I talk about how when the Glazers bought the club, because um, they owned the Tampa Bay Buccaneers um, in the NFL, um, Joel Glazer, I think it was, um, uh, commented that uh, at Tampa Bay, the fan, uh, the average fan would be spending from memory, I think it was, it was $45 um, at each game. And at United back then, it was £3.50. Um, and he couldn't understand why. And it was explained to him that the model um, of how we watch our football, which is we go to the pub beforehand, um, we have some drinks, we go to the ground, we might have a drink at the ground. As soon as the match is over, we're back in the pub. Um, we don't spend any money at the ground, really. We don't go to the shop um, and we don't eat there and stay there. And, um, it, yeah, this phrase you've used, which is the one they're all using, which is legacy fans. The legacy is, uh, as we all know, is it, it, it's actually a dirty word in business. Um, it implies traditional old bricks and mortar. It's used with, really in relation to retailers who haven't got a future. And what they want are tourist fans, because tourist fans take their kids they make a weekend of it. They might even stay at the hotel near the ground that the club might own. They go to the shop. They spend a load of money on shirts and everything else. Um, they will eat at the ground, and they'll, they're they not bothered about the prices. And, um, you, you know, that's the future. And uh, very quickly, I mean, at Fulham, as is well known, they've built this giant new stand, the Riverside Stand by the Thames. Um, there are seats in there. Uh, you can get season tickets, but they're three thousand pounds, or you know, this is Fulham. Um, but under the match day tickets are very expensive, and underneath the the stand there are sushi bars. Um, you can get wine, you can get beer, uh, coffee. I mean, it, it's all completely different. I'm in the Johnny Haynes, which is a 1901 stand, wooden seats, wooden floors, opposite. Um, and after the match, they've got uh, rock bands on. Um, uh, they put rock bands on at the Riverside to try and make the fans stay and spend more money. And that's really what it's all about. We are the meat and the sandwich. Um, there is a big issue here, which is, um, I'll stop in a second. Um, under the fair play rules, I mean, those big clubs have really got to to get the revenue up as high as they can if they're going to get the players that we we all want them to get. And so the fans, in a sense, have become the meat in that sandwich. Um, and there's no future, really, in for sadly, for legacy fans. You can only put our tickets up by RPI, you know, RPI plus 1% or something every year. Well, well that's no good. Um, they want people who are going to spend money, um, lots of money on tickets and all the memorabilia. So that's where we are. Go on, Charlie. Um, well, I, I, I think that's a very accurate observation of the situation and, and a very sort of panoramic one, which takes into account all the various different angles um, of, of, of the debate. Um, so uh, it's correct to say that for people running a football club, if you can attract tourism fans, day trippers, one-offs, global fans, whatever you might want to call it, that those people are more lucrative on the day than the majority of your regular audience, right? There's no doubt about that. And even at Charlton, we saw that recently when we played against Wrexham and we went on a sort of big marketing campaign to drag in as many of these people as possible. And the average spend per head on the day, that day, was about £1.20 higher across the entire stadium than it would be on a normal match day. But the thing that we have to consider as people running a football club is, yeah, but who comes the following Tuesday when you're playing Crawley Town at home as we are this coming Tuesday? Who is there when a pandemic hits and you urgently need support? Yeah. Who is there in the future when actually a whole new generation is used to growing up on digital entertainment and getting people to come to a stadium full stop becomes a little bit tougher, et cetera. Fandom is an unbelievably precious thing because this is an audience that you don't have to constantly market to. 
This is an audience that already follows the club, already knows everything that's going on at the club, that is basically the heart and the soul of the club. And I think any sports organisation that doesn't understand how precious that audience is, is very short-termist um, yeah. and, it, and isn't fully understanding of how f- proper franchises are built. By franchise, I don't mean like the US franchise system. I mean a, a proper business. A proper business is built with several different layers of different types of customers, underpinned always yeah by those who are the most fanatical about it. And those people have to be looked after very, very, very carefully. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing that football clubs do not do, um, you know, we talk about spend per head on the day. To my mind, the reason why spend per head is often lower at English football clubs than it should be elsewhere, and far lower than it is at German football clubs, I should say, is because what's normally on offer is utter rubbish. <laughs> the reason why a lot of fans go to the pub Right. In some cases, it's because of a particular liking for a particular pub. But generally speaking, it's because they're going to get better, cheaper beer in nicer yeah. surroundings. Yeah. So in actual fact, what we need to be doing as English football clubs, if we're really interested in spend per head, is trying to capture as much as possible of our traditional fans spend per head on the day. Because yeah. overall, our traditional fans are spending a lot on the day. They're going to the, they're often having something to eat, going to the pub beforehand, going back to the pub afterwards. Yeah. The reason they're not doing that at the stadium is because who wants to go and stand in a grotty co- concrete concourse drinking water down lager out of plastic cups? Yeah. No, no, no one wants to do that. Sorry, Chris. No, I was going to make two observations. One is that the your point about the, the season tickets sustaining is a very good one. I mean, here's the starter for 10. It's in my head. It's in the book. Um, but um, what's the lowest ever attendance at Old Trafford? Go on. Um, yeah, I can tell you it's three and a half thousand. Wow. And ha- how many times has Manchester United been relegated? Um, and the answer, if you include the old Newton Heath Railway, um, if you go back that far, the answer is five times. Um, so they might have a sense of entitlement now, and even the owners might have a sense of entitlement, but um, they need to remember their history. And the other observation I'd make, and this is, uh, when I was told this, I didn't believe it, um, but I checked it out, it was completely true, um, that um, there was a discussion at Manchester United. Um, they make more, I mean, this is the big, very biggest clubs. It's not Charlton and it's not Fulham um, and it's not the Baggies, but those big clubs, they make their real money now on TV rights. And it was pointed out at United that, if they what the te- what the broadcasters want to attract the audience and then therefore to attract the advertisers is atmosphere, and what they want is noise, and they want the singing. They love Liverpool because at Liverpool you get all the singing. Um, at United sometimes it can feel like a morgue, and same at Arsenal. And um, so it was proposed that they let fans in for free in the Stretford End provided they wore a lanyard, the free fans, no money on the season ticket, they had to wear a lanyard with a voice meter on and they had to sing songs. <laughs> um, now, when I was told this, I said, but surely what would happen if they sang anti-glazer songs? <laughs> and they said, yeah, good point. Um, but actually, if you think about it, and that was proposed and was discussed, you get in for free, provided you sing. The, if you think about it, that did actually happen in the Qatar World Cup. I mean, they paid people to turn up at those grounds and to create atmosphere. And at Arsenal now, um, I think I'm right in saying, they've, let, they've created an area behind the goal opposite the North Bank, which is for a group of supporters who get cheap subsidised seats, provided they drum and make noise, and that they are they're, they're the Ashburton Grove. They call themselves something. Um, so all the gooners will be on to me, but they do, and they they keep up a relentless amount of noise, and that's the deal. They're allowed in, and they s- sit in about ten rows behind the goal at the other end, and um, they're creating atmosphere. And, what these football all... clubs? What what I was going to say. What these football clubs, though, are guilty of, I think, is what in political terms would be known as cakeism, isn't it? Because yes. they want the 
global fans. They want the day trippers. And all of us have been abroad to watch football and understand that's a perfectly valid and legitimate yeah. thing to want to do. Those fans come because of the atmosphere. So yeah. even despite the 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 kind of the wariness around legacy fans, clubs like Manchester United and Liverpool need them because they create the atmosphere that draws in the other exactly people. Right. That's exactly so right. They can't do without the legacy fans at the same time as treating them in the case of Manchester United and £66 for kids and seniors with absolute yeah. contempt. But there's also a difference as well, as well, which is for most clubs. I mean, look, my my hometown club is Barrow. Um, and I'm in London now. I've uh, been there here for decades and I support Fulham. I live in, the, in you know, at this end of London. Um, but you know, for us, it's it's about creating atmosphere. It's about living the dream. Um, you know, we 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 go to matches in the hope. You know, we want to beat Arsenal next weekend. We want to beat Spurs away. Um, you know, good luck with that. But that's our dream, and we live the dream. Now, if you're an American owner, and the majority of clubs in the Premiership now are owned by Americans. Um, you don't have relegation. You don't have. You're not interested. Well, you are. You want to stay in the Premiership. And really what they're doing, and this is where it's changing under Jim Ratcliffe, Ratcliffe's put them more on a financial footing, but there is an element here of chasing the money. Um, and what's being lost, and this is the sad bit, and which you're alluding to, is the sense of community. Um, you don't find reference to community. When, when the Glazers bought the club, Malcolm Glazer only ever said 29 words about owning Manchester United. He, the, he repeated the word franchise three times. He never said community. He never said fans. He never said supporters. He used the word how, how great it was to, earn, to own this franchise. Well, that tells you an awful lot. And Jim Ratcliffe, I'm sure his, his heart might be in the right place, but you know, he's a hard-nosed businessman and he's trying to put it on a better footing. And, and let's not forget, in Manchester United's case, I, I mean, you know, I saw some figures the other day. They paid, you know, just replacing their manager, paying off Ten Hag and hiring the new guy just on the payoff and the, the fee to the Portuguese club. That's well over 20 million quid. Just like that, just gone. And how many times in the recent history have they done that? Yeah, I think uh, the figures I saw, Chris, were that the collective cost to United of sacking various managers during the Glazer era is 21 million, including the anorim. But go on, Charlie, you wanted to make a point. Well, I, I just want to address this this um, this word cakeism, um, which derives from um, my old boss, Boris Johnson's, <laughs> um, once, um, once phrase that he was both in favour of having cake and eating it. Um, and um, the cakeism exists on two sides, one of which is on the ownership side of saying, well, we want to have lots of atmosphere, we want to have all that, but we just want to soak as much money out of the situation as possible. And the other bit of cakeism is on the fan side, saying we want to watch the best in the world, we don't really want to pay for it. Um, and this is almost what the essence of the origin of this podcast is about. Where's the money gone? And the answer is, it's almost like there's a conspiracy. There isn't, of course, but it's almost like there's a conspiracy between the fans on the one hand and some of the owners on the other hand to um, just behave in as, in as illogical a way as possible. Now, what is the most precious thing about our football. I'm not going to talk about, I mean, probably we can include German football and Italian football in this. I'm not talking about football in German. I'm talking about the historic European and South American football countries with clubs that matter so much to so many people. The things that really matter to us is exactly generational support, is exactly handing down the support from one generation to another with all the stories and the sepia-tinted photographs and the memories and the moments when it brings the whole family together. You know, I haven't seen my son for the last couple, you know, seven or eight weeks. He's away. Um, my children at university and there's my older children. Um, and he's coming with me to a football match next weekend. That's what we're doing next weekend. And that will provide another treasured memory in our family history and so on and so forth. I'm already looking forward to Boxing Day for the same reasons. 
This is what matters. This really matters. And if only fans, and particularly fans leaders, would understand this, internalise it and explain it consistently, then owners and directors who behave in this way would be held to account. But they don't. They keep on saying, we need the best players in the world. We want to spend more. We want to do more and more and more. We want to get into Europe. We want to win the Champions League, etc. So is it that surprising? that when they're being assailed at fan meetings with questions about why the team isn't better, that the answer to that from the owners and the directors is, well, we could make it better. We could spend more money. And the way we can spend more money is by getting more money out of you, right? And that is the bit which really almost drives the fire in my belly to try and reform football. <laughs> well, look, as a supporter, is, is, is Charlie, actually... as a supporter, <laughs> I've got to take issue with you there because I think certainly at clubs like Manchester United, where you've got the Man United Supporters Trust, Spirit of Shankly, where we've spoken to Joe Blott on a podcast recently, I think the supporters leaders at most big clubs understand where most of the big money comes from in football, which isn't from supporters. It is from broadcasting revenues. And of course they want to see the best football, but at the same time, I think they will also look to the, the leaders of the club to show responsibility, to show fairness. I'm just going to take you to task on that. Yeah. I, I do not believe that there would have been anywhere near the level of protest there's been about the Glazers over the last 10 years if they'd actually been winning on the pitch. <laughs> yeah, I think the yeah. majority of Absolutely protests right. against the Glazers. Now, uh, and you only have to look back to last season, Adrian, when there were significant fan protests against Daniel Levy at Spurs, who is one of the best football executives and owners around, who does not do all this and who does care about his historic fans, he himself being a historic fan himself. What were the protests about? We never win anything. Although Spurs, That's what it's all about. Spurs oh, are so scrapping... Senior, I'll let you come in in a second, Chris. Spurs are scrapping senior concessions right. and putting up prices for junior. Right. So, Adrian, right. Adrian, Adrian, if you're Daniel Levy and you're having abuse screamed at you for not winning stuff, what do you do? Right? This is the problem. This is the fundamental problem. And you're right, of course, that but it's pennies. Groups... It's pennies, isn't it, Charlie? It's pennies. No, it's not. No, it's not. It all adds up. It, it, sorry, it's not. It all adds up. And that money either gets extracted from the fans or else the owner himself has to spend it. And it's not pennies to the owner. I'm telling you, if you're Daniel Levin, you're told, hey, I'll tell you what, put an extra five million pounds of your own money into the club, right? Or else try and extract it in small bits from lots of different revenue streams across the entire club. I'm telling you what the answer is going to be. So in the end, I mean, look, I agree with you that, that, that some of the big club supporters trusts are in their hearts. They are, um, they, they get this and they know this. Um, I think where there's a lack of leadership is that the support of the, the, the Football Supporters Association, which is generally speaking a very good organisation, which I'm very supportive of, I think that there needs to be more of a, a panoramic understanding of the issues that Chris was outlining at the start, which is if we are serious about preserving English football in the top flight as a multi-generational thing, we have as an entire fan base across all of our clubs to come together and to say to the powers that be, and indeed the new regulator, by the way, for whom this is going to be a topic which will be discussed at regulator level, we would rather preserve what we care about about our football rather than chasing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which is, I don't know, winning the Champions League 10 times in a row or whatever it might be. We, we're OK. We're, this is basically, this is the pact that German football has made, isn't it, Adrian? The pact yeah. that German football has made is we care more about our soul than we do about short-term silverware. Yep, 100%. 100%. 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. And, it's a yeah. pat, and, and it's a pact that English football fans have not yet made. And until they do, they will continue to be milked by the people that they're demanding deliver them the Champions League. That's the problem. John Chris. Yeah, I just want to, I mean, I've I got a couple of obs observations here. One is actually about my hometown club, Barrow. Um, Barrow was facing, was, 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 was bankrupt, um, heading for administration. Um, it was saved by a guy actually I was at school with who made a fortune in America, you know, a very nice guy called Paul Casson. Um, Paul Casson flew over, bought the club, uh, entirely his own money, and he did something had never been done before, and he tells this story, and it was the first sign of what the hell, what the hell he'd done. So he held a fans forum, and um, 
uh, yeah, instead of being treated like the conquering hero, he'd save the club. All the questions were, when are we getting so-and-so? When are we buying so-and-so? And he'd just gone and saved the club from bankruptcy. And all they cared about was uh, which of the top players can we get? And the other observation I'd make is that I think it's an appalling uh, development and it's a slippery slope, but for clubs might like, um, well, like Charlton, Fulham, the Baggies, Barrow, et cetera, et cetera, um, allowing the replays to be dropped in the Carabao. Um, it, the FA Cup. Shocking. FA Cup. FA it's Cup. the FA Cup. Absolutely shocking. And, um, you know, that's the slippery slope. We dream, uh, not, not, you know, not, but a club like Barrow, Barrow dreams of a, a you know, they, they dr love a, a, an away tie against a premiership club and then bringing them back to Barrow. Um, and that's what they love. That's absolutely, that would be your phrase, Charlie, that would go down the generations as a memory. And they're taking away the memories. And um, yeah, we are on a slippery slope here and the, the football fans are not making enough about this. And I don't know if the regulator is either. The conflict completely is between community and profit uh, and, 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 and the people owning the clubs. And that's where the conflict is. They're yeah, well, I mean, the fixture list as well is incredibly crowded at the moment. We've had three international breaks before Christmas this year. I can't remember anything quite as intense yeah. as that. And the run of games now, if you support an EFL club, as Charlie and I do in our different ways, between now and Christmas is absolutely yeah, ludicrous you see, in would, financial terms and, and in this. terms of the, the impact on players. Uh, I just you, want to ask you a question. Go on, sorry, Chris. Go well, on. I was going to say, if you talk to many Fulham fans... Um, you, you know, if they're honest, a lot of us, and when we're in the pub and things, we actually miss the EFL. Um, our, our, uh, they all our, miss it. They all miss it till no, they're no, back no, there, it's quite Chris. Serious. It's quite serious. <laughs> it's quite serious because the kickoff times move all the time. We hardly ever play on a Saturday anymore. There are funny times, Sundays, Friday night, I mean, all, to accommodate TV. Um, the Premiership brings with it a whole load of pressures. Uh, I mean, you, I tell you one more thing you can tell. When they when they start the premiership matches, the number of people who come on the pitch, it's like a procession. It's like the Lord Mayor's Parade. Um, and, the you know, we actually miss the championship. We miss, you know, uh, a Wednesday night against Barnsley. We do. Um, and there were free scoring games and it was a lot of fun. And, and I shouldn't say this, I'll be shocked, uh, tell you what, the fan, the away fans are nicer as well. Yeah, well, I'm sure, I'm sure there's less less club. entitlement. Chris, I just want to raise exactly. a really important point before we finish. I think this is really crucial, though, to this discussion, and particularly around the pricing at Manchester United. Charlie, you and I have spoken about how the new UEFA rules on spending are going to be very much tied to revenue. Yeah. Now, we both... I think, disagree that owners should spend vast sums of their personal wealth to prop up football clubs. I don't think that's healthy for the sport and I think it skews the game. But if we're not going to have owners, sugar daddies, piling money into football clubs, football clubs can only spend a percentage of what they earn. So going forward, if as you've suggested if man united for example want to have a chance of winning the champions league obviously they can appoint better managers than they have in the past and recruit more successfully than they have done in the past but ultimately if you want a club to compete to that level the only source of revenue is going to be television and supporters in the stadium pretty much merchandise but that will also be generated by supporters in the and, and sponsorship yeah. So go on, Charlie. I wanted, I wanted to put that point to you. I mean, in, in a sense, now we, as fans, were were hemmed into this world where where owners can't subsidise the club. So we, one way or another, to through TV subscriptions and through merchandising and through ticket prices, we're going to have to pay for it. Yeah. So this is where I think the new system of shadow boards is going to be really valuable, right? I mean, our, our shadow board at Charleston will be up and running in the new year with elected fan. Um, representatives, um, you know, uh, be 
constitute the majority of it. Um, and it's all, what we need to do is, is start a conversation about what the fans really want, what their priorities are, as, as it were. You know, at Charlton, we have uh, one of the top academies in the country. We've got um, with the early league one club to have a top women's professional team. We have the biggest community trust in the country. Um, and all these things in their own ways cost the club money, right? But they are important for the soul of Charlton because it's what ties Charlton to South East London like an umbilical cord. Charlton is nothing if not a total, we are the community club of the year as things currently stand. That's what we are. So the conversation comes, you know, with the shadow board is, look, we are the custodians of this club. We are running this club really on your behalf. What are your priorities? What are the things that you would like to see happen with your club? What will make you most happy about the club? And then you can start having those discussions about multi-generational uh, traditions being handed on. You can start having discussions about how to get supporters to spend more at the stadium on the day, not because they're being forced to, but because they want to. What are the things that we could do that would encourage that? You can start having conversations about local business and about how they can support their local club through sponsorship, not because they necessarily want more eyeballs on their product, but because they're buying into the social work you do locally and all this stuff. So these are the conversations that can be had and are had at German clubs, absolutely are had at German clubs, that I'm hoping that a mixture of the new cost control regulations, which effectively, as you say, bind the club totally to its revenue, combined with the new shadow board structures that we're starting to see, hopefully will enable us to move towards a more collaborative, more sensible, more logical approach to prioritization. Um, and I think it will. I think it will happen. But I, just with a bit of an asterisk against the very biggest clubs who would see themselves, and of course, this discussion is happening off the back of Man United, um, the very biggest clubs who would see themselves as competing against Bayern and Real and Barca, et cetera, et cetera, who would say, OK, well, that's all very well for you guys, but actually we're, we're in a different place here. You know, what really matters to us is competing in the Champions League. And we're not just thinking about the fans we've got in the stadium. We're thinking about the millions of other fans we have around the world who won't be such fans of ours if we're not in the Champions League. So that, let's go back to where we started, which is we started off with Man United doing something which is quite clearly against multi-generational support of, of that kind of level of fandom. You can't debate it. When you start removing concessions you make it totally unaffordable for a family to go to a game. It's just impossible. I, I, I couldn't afford it. I could Playing 70 quid for each of my kids, plus on, on top of me and my wife, I couldn't afford that. No chance on a regular basis. Once a season, maybe. So quite clearly, that is against multi-generational support. There's no, there's no question about that. The question is, is, is there the sort of, is there the level of understanding on both the club side, Ratcliffe side, and on the Manchester United supporters' trust side to enable the right conversation to happen. It's not just a protest, it's a conversation. Go on, Chris. One last final thought, briefly, please. Yeah, I think I think what we're seeing, Charlie's exactly right. I mean, what we're seeing really in football um, is a two-tier, it's a complete split. I mean, you've got the very biggest clubs who, um, it, look, when I was writing a book on Manchester United, I mean, all sorts of phrases were thrown at me from people around the club um, I mean, Charlie's alluded to it then, but, you know, um, uh, more important to them. I mean, one of them actually said to me, more important to us is that the fact that we have more we have more fans in North America than we do in the UK. Uh, and that apparently is true. Worldwide, their audience is enormous. Their reach is huge. That's why they go on these Far Eastern American tours all the time. Um, you're getting this complete split between the as Charlie calls it, the intergenerational fans um, who go along because they always have done, it's their family tradition, um, and then people around the world. And there is a complete complete split, uh, uh, you know, different types of club. And somehow we're trying to bring them all together. I do think the fans have to do more. And I do think this, I think that point you make is a very good one. It's not about protest. If you think about it, um, the fans protested against the Glazers for 19 years. They didn't get anywhere at all. Nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. Um, it didn't make any difference in the slightest to the way the Glazers ran the club. If anything, it made it worse. Um, there was just no conversation, no discussion. Frankly, you know, at risk of upsetting people, there wasn't much intelligence shown. And... Um, you know, it didn't go anywhere at all. And that's what we need. And the government, or I hate to think of the government getting involved in football, 
But if it is to be a regulator, they need to bring football back to their communities. That's what really matters more than anything, or else it's lost. Chris, thank you so much for your time. That is Chris Blackhurst. His book is out now. And as I say, it's uh, a Christmas present, a stocking filler <laughs> for the Man United fan in your life. It is called The World's Biggest Cash not, Machine. Not just Man United fans, all no, fans. Indeed. Football fans in general, then. All right, then. Uh, the World's <laughs> Biggest Cash Machine, Manchester United, the Glazers, and the struggle for football. So thanks, as always, to Charlie as well. And many thanks to Jed Thomas for helping out to, with production on this episode and to Mark Machado, who handles our socials at 11.29. And there will be a chapter in my forthcoming book, Where's the Money Gone?, about German football. If you want to follow me on Substack, you can see the occasional draft as this book goes through its very slow gestation. Head over to adriangoldberg.substack.com for the occasional draft chapter. Thank you both. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening. If you are watching this on YouTube, by the way, don't forget to smash that subscribe button. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify or any other podcast streaming network, please subscribe as well. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to spread the word. Thanks for listening. Cheers now. Bye-bye.